musician, a long distance kayaker, a businessman, she looks after animals, artist, author. We interview remarkable people. They're talented in so many different areas. You're listening to The Dialogue, 89.7 FM Eastside Radio. You're listening to 89.7 FM Eastside Radio. This is Natasha and The Dialogue, where we interview remarkable people. Today I have a remarkable man in the studio with me. I have Adrian Newstead, who is an art guru, art consultant, and author. Hello. Hi, Natasha. How are you? I'm going to ask you to come and love that microphone up a little bit more. <laughs> we, 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 we tend to like that. Um, you live down the road from me. Do I? You do. You live down the road from me. And I walk past your gallery every single day when I walk my dog. And I've always wanted to know who was in there. Ah. So um, I'm now happy to see you sitting in front of me and to find out a little bit about your story. Because when I was introduced to you, I was told that you were an amazing man. You've been awarded an Order of Australia Medal. And you have been highly recognized for your contribution to the, uh, to the art world, to the Aboriginal art world and I think to the art world generally. So you, you kind of, you're kind of good in my seat over there as a, as a remarkable person. How does that make you feel? <laughs> um, flattered, privileged. You are flattered, privileged. As we do in this show, we take you back to your childhood because I'm a firm believer that childhood is actually where you form so many of the ideas that take you through into your life. And you um, charmed life. Sydney born and bred, charmed, wonderful life. Nothing, no, no, nothing, no, nothing rocked your world, did it? Not really, no. I had uh, loving and supporting parents. Um, <coughs> I, um, I didn't go through any... Um, mental health issues I wasn't abused I um, I wanted for nothing I went to a good school uh, Scots College and um, uh, I enjoyed my childhood immensely I was uh, living in the eastern suburbs surrounded by cultured people my mother was an actress my father a ladies hairdresser quite a famous one he had a number of salons around from um, from Wollongong to Newcastle, and uh, and um, he won an award, didn't he? He was <coughs> oh, he was the permanent wave champion of the world. My goodness, in Brussels, I mean that's huge. I mean that's that, that, I mean that's a that, that's a great accolade, you know, for the world, <laughs> the world. But you had quite a lot of you, quite a lot of creative people in and out of your home, quite a lot of art around you. So you grew up in that environment where there was you had quite a bit of good experience of the world already in your home. Yeah, I did, and um, they were my parents were well, well read. They were involved in theatrical circles, and uh, so and it was a nurturing Jewish home. I was, uh, uh, you know, we weren't uh, we weren't religious per se, but we went to the the synagogue for all the high holidays and everything. Of course, you did. I mean, uh, that that would that would be expected. But you loved the outdoors. You were an outdoor freak. Well, I was fortunate in that my parents enrolled me into the Cub Scouts when I was very young, and uh, I went from the Cubs to the Boy Scouts to the Senior Scouts, which meant that every weekend or every second weekend I got to uh, spend in the bush and um, in, you know, in, as is the way with the Boy Scouts, you do all these badges and things, but they teach you a lot of different skills, outdoor skills, backwoodsman skills, carpentry etc we made our own canoes and and uh, went on extended trips down the Nepean and the Hawkesbury and other places and living out in the bush uh, it was a fantastic uh, upbringing and um, it made me want an outdoor life and uh, so as with most uh, Jewish boys in the eastern suburbs, they're expected to go to university. Uh, there was never any doubt I was going to go to university. But no doctor or lawyer for you. No, I didn't want to be. I didn't <laughs> want anything that would would uh, end up in a life indoors in an office and with paperwork and everything. I had a, an aversion to that. I wanted an outdoor life. And, I, and um, <clears throat> so I did agricultural science at university, which was very odd. I think I was the only Jewish person in the uh, in the <laughs> year, 
Um, and uh, even though I wasn't particularly good in the sciences, etc. I, I'd, I'd done plenty of it and I managed to scrape through. But during university days, uh, not only was I going out bush and and uh, involving myself in, in, in that, because um, uh, if you did agricultural science, you had to do s- uh, six months during your holidays over the four years of the course out on farms and properties, which I did. And, and you'd uh, love that. I did. I you loved, loved that. Yeah. Do you think that loving the outdoors and doing what you did gave you an understanding and an appreciation of the Aboriginal people in Australia and the life that they live yeah. as, you know, sort of hunter gatherers and living off the land? That's something that you had experienced and loved so much, and that was obviously yeah. something that they brought into their art. Do you think that's <coughs> where a large amount of affinity came in for you? I think the affinity might have come there, but I had no uh, contact with Aboriginal people at all at that stage, and I didn't until very, very much later. Actually, after I returned from travelling overseas for over four years, um, I travelled around the world. After I finished my degree, I worked in various third world countries. I was interested in third world development. And so when I came back to Australia and I discovered that we had a third world right Running here on doorstep. our doorstep, that really was kind of shocked me and it and I had an instant. Um, something instantly happened in me. I think it happened when I saw and appreciated my first bark painting and I realised as I looked at it that absolutely everything in this, abs- in this gorgeous painting... Um, was ma- was um, indigenous to the place in which it was made. The bark from the tree, the earth pigments, even the brushes that were used to make it were taken of hu- from human hair or from crushed grasses or whatever. And 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 well, that really was excited it me. It was a it was a very special thing, and I got very. As soon as I started to put Aboriginal art into the into the emporium that I started um, after I came down from the Blue Mountains where I lived for some time and ran a restaurant, I um, it wasn't very long before Aboriginal art became uh, more and more present amongst the the range of items that the handmade items that we had the in, the, in the Emporium. Now, when mm. I spoke to you a little bit earlier, other than the Boy Scouts, I asked you what you wanted to be when you were younger. And, you know, when you, what, you know some kids want to be a fireman. Some, some want to grow up and, and, you know, change the world and be the president. You said you wanted to be 35. <laughs> <laughs> Which, let's be honest, is nothing I've ever heard before. <laughs> and it's such a bizarre age. <laughs> what about 35 does it for you? And, and how were you at 35? Can you remember? I do indeed. And um, <laughs> I don't know what age I was when I, when I decided I wanted to be 35. But um, but I I realised oh, it seemed to me um, uh, that um, that a human person, um, if they're lucky enough to grow up free of a lot of psychological baggage, uh, um, has an opportunity to flower into a whole uh, healthy psyche. And when I thought about it, I thought, when would be the time in life when you would just have everything together? When, you know, when you really, and I thought it was 35. 35. I thought at 35, you should have figured out what you want to do. You should have enough money to do it. You should be, you should be happy inside your own skin and you should be powering. You know, I I think that's such a beautiful thing because, you know, it it shows a positive mindset, doesn't it? You're listening to Natasha Moyer and I am hosting The Dialogue with Adrian Newstead, art guru, art consultant and author. And we are talking to him as a remarkable person. A little bit about his life and obviously what he's done in terms of his contribution to art and Aboriginal art in Australia. Awarded an OAM. And obviously a remarkable person. Now, um, other than the Boy Scouts and the fact that you wanted to be 35 and you loved a bit of geography, 
You were also, as I would call you, an activist. Because despite the fact that you clearly were not 100% sure what you wanted to do, you did like to be the top of the pile. So you were the president of the debating society and the president of the society and the president of that society. And even when you finally moved your gallery to uh, Paddinghurst, um, as you called it, you um, you then became, I think, the Pre- leader... The leader the, the, of the Chamber the of Commerce. Of Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a desire in you to do really well and be an activist, and we're going to touch on that. But what I'm very curious about was that you said something I think was really interesting. You said, when you grow up in a privileged environment or a comfortable environment, one of the things that concerns you is that you will lack motivation as an adult to succeed and do the things in life that you might want to do. Tell me, talk to me a little bit about that feeling. Have you? Uh, was that something that you, you concerned you? Yeah, I found it very hard to have a sense of purpose. It's a very common question, you know. What do you want to be when you grow up? I really didn't know what I wanted to be when I grow up. I knew what I didn't want to be, um, and I knew that I had a unique opportunity to discover. I have another per- little philosophical thing that I often tell kids. Um, which is basically uh, indulge in your interests and out of it will come your vocation. If you're really lucky, like I was, uh, that's certainly the case. So so I was, um, as a young adult, I wanted to explore as much as possible. A lot of people at 20 years of age uh, finish university or don't get to go to university, they go straight into a job. Before they know it, they've got children, and at 35 years of age, <laughs> they, have a, so they have a midlife crisis. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I was very aware um, of that and the fact that I didn't want to have children at an early age, and I didn't want to be tied down, and I didn't want to work for um, one particular organisation. I, I, I loved geography. I excelled at it at school. I was fascinated by other cultures. Um, and I wanted to travel, and I spent a great deal of my 20s uh, on the road, um, travelling right through Asia and Europe, etc., and ended up in on a kibbutz in Israel, where once again I was the head of all oh, the I, work I, programs. I could never <laughs> imagine you being anything other than that, but listen, you weren't always that liked. I mean, someone threw you through a plate glass window. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> I yeah. Mean, what happened well, to you? Well, you asked me if I was an activist. You were an I, activist. I mean, you are an activist. Uh, as I as I told you um, before, the um, I really believe um, that uh, you know a young person that that isn't um, doesn't have a social conscience isn't really worth their you know worth much and uh, so if you come from a privileged background and you treat privilege as if it's the norm um, well it's a bit sad and for me you know I was always an activist I I was uh, very left-leaning at university Uh, I was heavily involved in the Vietnam moratorium movement I was thrown through a plate glass window in Pitt Street um, during a moratorium demonstration Uh, It was one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me in my life and I went back to my room and I went through a serious, um, serious psychological drama, dilemma uh, over it and um, and I was just absolutely boiling with fury about the way the police had just corralled everybody up and forced them into a blind alley and, and... Brought, brought the whole thing upon everybody. So, you know, th- those sort of things are very uh, formative experiences, I suppose, um, in terms of how you feel about the state and um, um, uh, and personal freedoms um, and uh, freedom to believe in various things. So this has certainly um, affected me in my later life. So let's talk a little bit about the fact that you have become a huge influence in the Aboriginal art world. Obviously as a consultant slash dealer um, and also in terms of what you've done for the different auction houses, you've worked with the different auction houses and, and you've been a huge part of this. The Aboriginal art movement obviously has some huge positives because it's brought about an understanding of a culture that we 
didn't necessarily understand. But it's also brought with it some issues as well for that culture in, in, in lots of different ways. So how have, you, how have you tackled it and actually been instrumental in how that's kind of worked? It's a lovely broad question, isn't yeah. it? I'm kind of just like, let, let's go. Let, let's go with it. I suppose my question, my, my, the, what I'm really trying to find out is, do you ever get conflicted about what you're doing? Because it's to do with money and art and culture, and that's always an interesting di- dichotomy. Well, I'm never conflicted about that, but that's, other people are. Well, <laughs> and a lot, of, uh, a lot of the people that have kind of acted adversarially towards me are obviously conflicted about that. There is an enormous schism, if you like, between the bureaucratic archipelago and private dealers uh, who, are, who, who are always suspected of base motives. And yet, you know, private dealers have been the closest of friends to Aboriginal people and, um, um, and have put their own lives and their own finances on the line in many cases for them. But of course, you know, that saying that uh, it goes without question that there are um, exploitative, unethical people out there that have uh, treated ab- Aboriginal people and every other minority group abysmally. And, um, um, but I can't... Um, I can't speak for them. No, otherwise nobody would have given you that OAM. <laughs> you can I ask you in in your in your um, dealings with the art world, obviously on an Aboriginal level, who do you think is the mo- most prolific artist that has come out of this movement of the Aboriginal art movement? Yes. I mean, who would you say if I were to say to you, you needed to use one example of what Aboriginal art is and stands for from a from a cultural point of view? Who 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 would come to mind for you? Well, I'm trying to avoid saying Emmeline Worry, but I guess I'm going to say well, Emmeline well, you Worry. Know. Um, I, only because she was incredibly prolific. She produced something like six thousand paintings between the age of seventy nine and eighty six when she died. And uh, I think about a lot of um, older people uh, living in retirement homes or wondering, thinking that their lives are over at 79. And then I think of somebody like that old woman um, who was so powerful um, and who had lived a life as a domestic, really, um, and then suddenly out of nowhere... Of course, she was a camel driver as well and uh, ambidextrous. She could paint with both hands simultaneously. Amazing. She was just uh, a sheer force of nature. And um, and yet her paintings, although they appear utterly abstract to the, to the untrained eye, um, they um, are full of... They're only about... Her dreamings, her the ceremony, ceremonial reenactment of those dreamings, the body paintings, um, and all the other sort of imagery that pertains to um, her her um, totemic yam and pea and gr- and grasses and. Um, we're going to come back and just talk a little bit about why this art movement started. I'm talking to Adrian Newstead. This is the dialogue with Natasha Moy. He's an art guru, art consultant, and author. Has um, been awarded an OAM. I love OAM people that come into my and I just always feel like I'm just you know hobnobbing with the best of the best. It makes me feel good about myself. Me, no, it's me that I feel just good about myself. Um, <laughs> now you were t- we were talking earlier about the fact that the older Aboriginal artists wanted to put that work down because they wanted to pass on their culture and they wanted people to, you know, their, their, their children and their grandchildren to remember and to share the stories. And it, it, is that, but, but it never kind of come out in a canvas. You know, suddenly they had these canvases and they were able to do this. Why, why was that suddenly so important? Well, um, I, think about um, people afraid of their way of life, a way of life that's, um, they don't even know how old it is, but if we say it's 60,000 years old, um, and uh, it's now been impacted by another culture, and within a generation, um, uh, Aboriginal people are alienated from the places, the most sacred places where their ceremonies have been performed. Um, for millennia and so um, uh, afraid that their culture uh, is going to end with them and afraid for the future of their children um, somehow 
this miracle of painting, um, uh, the opportunity to paint begins. I won't go into the stories of how it begins, but it begins and they start painting and the paintings become a new way of telling the stories and passing them on to their children and the children are still living in very, very, very remote places. These children, um, um, are, you know, they don't get a secondary or tertiary education. There's not much for them out there. And um, and they have, um, you know, they have no jobs. There's no prospects. There's, they're worse than the worst country towns in terms of any prospects for the for their inhabitants. And so... Um, now we're seeing, you know, a new generation of painters, which are these, the people that those old people pass the, the stories on to. And, um, you know, people say, well, uh, you know, this is, uh, well, the, for the government, uh, it seems like a worthwhile employment strategy. Nothing has worked in any of those communities, despite, you know, uh, all sorts of enterprises mm. being tried since the 1950s. Well, this uh, is something they love. This is something that's part of, it's part of their, their DNA. Well, it's more than that, I think. Um, look, anybody that's ever tried to paint a canvas with a field of dots, <laughs> right? And I, I suggest some, you know, if you were, some listener wants to try it, just try painting a beautifully meticulous clean field of dots on a you know a two uh, a 90 by 60 canvas never mind a bigger one and see what happens i mean it's a meditation and it's a um it puts you in touch with your inner self it's like uh, vipassana meditation or you know in vipassana you concentrate on the touch sensation of the air as it goes in and out of your lungs and your nose and across the your mouth and um, your upper lip and and uh, it, when you're when you're painting uh, a dot painting you know it's it's not inside you but it's the movement of your hand it's so meticulous and um, and your mind well an Aboriginal person's mind uh, especially those really old people uh, their mind is off in some reverie um singing one of the thousands upon thousands of verses of their song line which is what they're actually painting so you know when a p- aboriginal person paints a painting it's a if you like a freeze frame out of a much longer narrative um but they're concentrating on a particular place on a particular ceremony or whatever and they're re vivifying the ceremony by repeating the the song in their mind and so often you know I've sat in a room with I don't know 40 or 50 painters and one will be painting and start chanting uh, out loud and and one by one each person in the room joins them until the entire room is singing an obscure verse from a from a particular s- song line on dreaming narrative. It's really spine chilling. Must be amazing. Must be an incredible experience. We're coming towards the end of our interview. Um, but obviously, your gallery now is in Bondi. Mm-hmm. And um, I intend to go in there. I believe that every single person in Australia should own an Aboriginal piece of art. And I believe every single person should own an opal. I think there are really important things that we don't, that we don't, we ourselves, it's not for tourists to buy our opals and our Aboriginal paintings. It is for Australians to own those things because that is part of the land that we live in. Mm. I think it's really important. Um, well, when I was um, first engaged in Aboriginal art, probably the first spiritual man I ever met, his name was Gabu Ted Thomas from Wallaga Lake on the south coast of New South Wales. And my wife and I used to help him with... Um, what he called dreaming camps where he would get people from many different cultures into the deep wilderness and he'd teach them about Aboriginal culture. And um, he said to me very early, put art on people's walls, it'll do more to change their attitude towards Aboriginal people than anything else you could do. I've always thought of, you know, uh, a painting is like a... um, 
Well, a work of art ha- can have a profound effect on people. You know, you buy an Aboriginal painting, you put it on your wall and you live with it. You, every cre- work of art, every, every item you have around you that has a creative import um, not only exerts its influence upon you, but when other people come into the environment that you created with those things, they are, you know, an extension of your aura, your personality beyond the confines of your body. Mm. And so people judge you on who you are by the things that you surround yourself with as well. So if you really feel strongly about Aboriginal people and... um, and the fact that this country was stolen from Aboriginal people, that it al- is and always will be Aboriginal land, and that you ha- you want to show your respect. Showing respect is more than just, um, you know, um, I don't know, listening to a welcome to country at the beginning of some speech that you go to Absolutely. or whatever, although that has its place. Um, uh, but, you know, for each of us as a per- as an individual... You know, we can all make a positive affirmation of our fealty with Aboriginal people uh, in the way we live, in the things we surround ourselves by and in our attitudes towards them and our respect for the fact that they are, you know, they are and always will be the first Australians and, um, um, and that everything we enjoy in our lives... Uh, um, is um, uh, a gift bestowed by them either um, either consciously or unconsciously, either from political will or political angst. <laughs> but for whatever reason, we are the beneficiaries and... Um, and we're blessed. I yeah, think we're very I lucky. Think so. I, think, I think we're very blessed for that. We've actually come to the end of our interview. Um, I've been interviewing Adrian Newstead, art guru, art consultant, author. We didn't even get to your book, unfortunately, but I know you have spoken about that in the past. Thank you they so They can buy a copy of the book by coming to my gallery. Oh, I think everyone should go to your in gallery. In Lamrock Avenue, Bondi Beach. That's where it is. Um, you beat me to it. <laughs> and I just want to say thank you so much for being so honest and sharing your journey with us and with me and I look forward to seeing the wonderful things that you're going to continue to do because I expect you're going to be very much like those old Aboriginal ladies I think your life as you get as, as it gets on will become more busy more interesting and more active I would don't imagine don't say that to my ways. wife <laughs> she's probably not listening <laughs> so thank you so much for, um, for coming in today and interviewing thanks with so us. much indeed